Hi, my name is David Rimmer. Um, today we've got a slightly different format for the seminar, and it's going to be a kind of joint presentation between myself, I'm Richard Duncan, and uh, you know, Ben Shield from ANU. I'm not going to introduce myself, but I'm going to quickly going to introduce Ben before he gets into it. So, it's Ben. Uh, Ben's currently an ARC lecturer fellow and uh, recently appointed senior lecturer down at ANU. Um, ben did his PhD at ANU, uh, postdoc at James Cook, and then uh, has come back to Canberra. Um, Ben's got, um, I think, really sort of quite wide ranging interests in, in, in conservation ecology. And what we're going to talk about today is a project that Ben's leading around understanding processes of species decline. He's very kindly got me involved in the work. And so we're going to just want to do a, a bit of a, a joint thing of work that we've that been sort of led and recently completed, and a bit about some, some work that we're trying to um, progress. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And thanks everyone for the invitation to come. And before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal and Namri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as Richard said, the topic for today's talk is focused on species declines. And we always think about like if you work in ecology or conservation, there's a lot of work focused on reductions in the distribution of species. And as we'll see in the introduction, that's the standard way to do it. But we've been thinking over the last few years about how we can actually look at this and get a bit more nuance into the actual patterns and processes underlying species declines. Click on the... So before we jump into the detail, I just want to provide a bit of an overview of the structure of the talk. I'll outline the rationale of why I think it's useful and informative to examine species declines through a niche lens. And then I'll talk about some work that we just published last week on changes in range and niche dynamics for Australian frogs. And then Richard will come in, he'll talk a little bit about some of the co common problems with sampling bias. And so there's this mass influx of biodiversity data in places like ALA and GBIF. They're generally presence only records and they're really useful or they can be useful, but they also have a whole range of biases that we need to be able to account for. And then Richard will talk about the second case study that's on the decline of the northern quoll and the subsequent spread of the cane toads. And with that method, he'll talk a little bit about how we can account for sampling bias. And then I'll come back just for two slides where we'll talk about both the ecological as well as conservation implications of these patterns and processes. So it's no surprise to everyone, we're in an era of mass decline. This is from the IBES report from a few years ago. You can see the whole range of different species groups and the range of endangerment. Um, amphibians, we can see here, a third of all species at risk of extinction. And so the general pattern that a lot of species are undergoing declines is really widespread and well-established. The criteria that we use to judge this is the IUCN red list categories. And so probably that's familiar to everyone in the room too. So in particularly how species end up in the pathway that they take to being either vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered. So this is a screenshot of the assessment criteria. So there's five different um, criteria that we can see here. And perhaps the most commonly used when assessing species declines is the first, which focuses on either reductions in population size or the extent of occurrence, in other words, geographic distribution, or the abundance of the species. And so it's used because it's easy. Basically, you just need at least um, a handful of occurrence records. You can calculate the extent of occurrence of a species between two time periods and see how it's changing. And the purpose of the talk today isn't to criticize that method. It's a useful method. And importantly, it does correlate with extinction risk. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. But I think that we miss an opportunity to actually understand different pathways and environmental patterns that emerge if we can examine changes in species distribution through a niche lens. And this idea of looking at whether or not declines happen in a predictable pattern across environmental gradients. So of course, we can also do landscape ecology. And most of my work, actually, I would say I'm sort of a wildlife ecologist. Um, we can study populations in detail. We can do population demographic work. That's sort of the gold standard. That will tell us a lot about the populations, the threats, how they're responding to the threats. But we can't do that for all populations in a species, let alone all species, or try to think about this stuff at a global or a continental scale. So we need somewhere, I'd argue, that's in the middle between just inferring changes in the distribution of species 
and then you know of course where we need to we can get a lot more detailed demographic work happening too so this all started a few years ago when we published this paper that you can see at the bottom of the screen here and it said that when species are declining coincidentally they're also going to be experiencing reductions in their realized niche breadth so their niche breadth is just the range of different environmental conditions across which the species is found and you're probably thinking well that's obvious and that is obvious that's not that informative but i think where it actually gets interesting is that these declines across environmental gradients are generally going to be non-random and so there may be predictable patterns to the decline of different species depending on the species characteristics its distribution and also how the threat is operated and there's several different mechanisms that could lead to this non-random patterns of species decline so if we look here this is sort of analogous to the, the basic iucn Criteria, it's just inferring across two different time periods, the distribution of the species and how much it is contracted by. If we look at a similar simple representation of niche space, we have species abundance up here on the y-axis and then just environmental space on the x. This could be any one of hundreds of different environmental or climatic conditions that may influence whether or not a species occurs there. So we can see that it's historical realized niche was larger and it's contracted to a subset of the environmental conditions across what it previously occupied. So it's extirpated through these areas and it's particularly if it's persisting in this subset of environmental space. If we introduce now another set of axes, so at the top we have threat impact and then again environmental space. The solid blue line, we can think about that as the realized impact or distribution of the threat across environmental space, whereas the dashed blue line, sorry, the dashed blue line is the potential distribution of the threat and the solid blue line is the actual distribution. So we could see we may have geographic refuge here. This may be an offshore island where an introduced predator doesn't occur, but a vulnerable prey species does. We could have environmental refuges. These may be areas outside the distribution of the threatening process. And so the threat can never occur there with the geographic refuge. The threat could occur there. It just hasn't got there yet. But I think most interestingly, this is space in the middle where we have conditions that are either amplifying the threat impact or potentially reducing the threat impact. So here we have a persistence in this set of environmental space, and that's because the threat is being mediated by those environmental conditions there. And we're going to talk a lot about this with the case study of Australian frogs, but a non-frog example is the decline of chestnut blight in the chestnut trees due to the introduction of chestnut blight in. North America, so in the harbour forests of North America, chestnut trees, one of the most common species, this introduced fungus emerged and literally caused the death of billions of tree species. But the species didn't become extinct, it still persists in reasonable abundance in some areas. But the areas where it persists, they're these dry, high disturbance sites. And that's because dry, high disturbance environments are unsuitable for this fungal pathogen. So this fungal pathogen is preferring cooler more enclosed canopy sites. And so we see this environmentally selective pattern of decline where the threat is widespread, but the impact of the threat is more severe under certain environmental characteristics. And then the other mechanism that I think is informative to talk about, and it comes back to our frog example is, you may have a situation where threat impact is relatively consistent across environmental space, but there's something about these environmental conditions here that mean that the population is able to withstand this threat impact. And I've got a photo of the Alpine tree frog here across some work up in the Snow Mountains. And this species was largely extirpated from ephemeral pond habitats, but it persists in perennial pond habitats. And the main threat in this case was chytrid fungus. And the threat is basically uniform throughout this whole environment in the high country. There's lots of chytrid and lots of impact in these ephemeral systems, as well as the perennial systems. But one thing that distinguishes these two environments is when we have a drought, we have almost complete improvement failure in the tap holes in this system. Whereas in these more perennial water bodies, we have a relatively consistent level of improvement. So there's something about the environmental conditions. In this case, more assured improvement that means that the species may be able to persist in a particular environmental space despite the impact of the threat. So now, hopefully with that bit of background, I want to talk a little bit about some work we published last week. And this was looking at range and niche dynamics of Australian frogs and got a photo of Jeff Hurd here. So he was a key collaborator in this project over the last few years. And we centered this work with the broad question of how has chytrid fungus influenced the distribution 
as well as realized niches of native frog species in Australia. And we took advantage of what, what you might call a natural experiment. So we had a situation where we have chytrid fungus introduced into Australia. Some species have declined, some species have not declined. So we have we were able to model the distribution and niche for 55 species of frog in Eastern Australia. Each of these dots here represents a species. So this is the geographic centroid of their distribution. And we have 25 that are chytrid impacted and 30 that are chytrid non impacted. And so the two groups of species, they were species that occur in the same geographic spaces and they were species from the same sure. genera. And the different colors here represent different times in which chytrid had become established across the distribution of these species. And so that was important because we looked at the distribution and niche characteristics of species before and after these different time periods, which we can see pictured up here. So we had two key hypotheses that we were interested in testing with this work. And the first was that the chytrid impacted species should show greater reductions in their extent of occurrence, as well as niche hypervolume. And niche hypervolume just means a way of calculating the broad range of environmental conditions across which species occur, um, that those declines should be greater relative to our chytrid non-impacted species. And I've got relative highlighted there because we were interested in the change above and beyond what we observed for the control group of species. So climate change, habitat loss, other invasive species, a whole range of factors could be driving shifts in frogs. So we were interested in trying to isolate that effect that might be happening for the chytrid impacted species above and beyond the non-impacted species. And we also hypothesized that the declines for our chytrid impacted species should follow a predictable pattern in environmental space. And that's because chytrid fungus, it's a, of course a species itself, it has to prefer habitat conditions and environmental conditions. It likes cool, wet areas, and it's much more virulent and prevalent in those areas. It's not found so commonly in the hotter, drier areas. And in itself, it can be killed by temperatures of above about 27 degrees. So we anticipated that the contractions in our chytrid impacted species should show particular patterns in environmental space. A little bit of background, this figure just shows the rough spatial temporal pattern of emergence of chytrid. So we have chytrid first detected in 1978. So obviously no one was looking for chytrid in the 70s, but going back and looking at preserved museum specimens, we find DNA of chytrid on at least one frog species collected near Brisbane in 1978, and then spread north and south. Um, it's also in Western Australia, but there's no evidence for frog declines there. So we focus in the eastern part of the continent. This gray black shading represents the area of high environmental suitability for the pathogen. So it's more widespread than this, but this is the area where it's roughly associated with amphibian declines. So overall, we have declines in 43 frog species, and we have around just under 250 frog species in Australia. So it's not that far off causing declines in a fifth of the continent's amphibian fauna, which is pretty remarkable, I think. And unfortunately, we've lost seven species, six or seven species, depending on taxonomy. And um, we weren't able to model these species because they changed through time because there's no contemporary records for them now. But we were able to model their niche characteristics using all the records. And I won't talk about it today, but those species that became extinct, they do occupy a particular subset of environmental space. And like I said, it's the cooler, wetter areas. So just one slide on the methods to hopefully make the results a little bit more intelligible. For each species, we had two sets of its occurrence records. So one was the full set of records across all time periods. And the second was a subset of those records following the chytrid emergence year for that particular species. And this we had to do this rather than just compare before and after, because we have this general mass increase in the number of occurrence records that we have for each species through time. And that's not just frogs in Australia, that's all biodiversity. So if you look at a histogram, they increase rapidly from the 90s and then really exponential growth in the 2000s in the number of occurrence records that we have for species. And so if we didn't have a full set of records and then a subset, we'd have a situation where we had these in apparent increases in the distribution as well as the range of environmental conditions across which species were um, found. And so there's no evidence for systematic range or niche expansion in any of these frog species, because if there was with by embedding the data set, the post-chytrid data set and the full data set, we wouldn't be able to test for that. 
um, but that doesn't appear to be a problem. And we also had to account for the differences that this method introduced in terms of sample size, because of course, the number of occurrence records that we had post Kittrick was always a smaller subset of the full occurrence records for that species. So we modeled the extent of occurrence and then also the niche hyper volumes for each species. And got a photo here of Jared Sofanescu. He was an undergrad here. Some of you might remember him. Um, he's been working for the last few years with me as an RA and is also undertaking his PhD at University of WA at the moment. We used the four um, climate and then elevation niche dimensions that you can see on the screen. And that's because they are characteristics or environmental predictors of suitability for chytrid fungus. So other work has identified those four variables as being important for shaping the distribution of chytrid in Australia. And then this is where Richard came in with his collaboration. So he was in charge of the statistical analyses of the model changes in distribution, as well as niche characteristics. And it was set up as a before after control impact analysis. So we have our chytrid impacted species, our chytrid non impacted species, and we have before and after the emergence of chytrid fungus in Australia. So this is what the data look like in, in a simplistic example for one species. We can see the orange are records prior to the emergence of chytrid and the green are records following the emergence of chytrid. So we can see that even just from looking at this figure here in geographic space, there's obviously gonna be a contraction to a certain set of environmental conditions. So now let's look at some examples. So first up, I'll start with two exemplar species before we get into the overall results. So if we look at changes in, in extent of occurrence for parents tree frogs, so a non-impacted species, we can see that, um, you'll see the key in a moment, but we have yellow for the contemporary period and then blue for the full set of records. So they're basically the same for this species. And if we look at a chytrid impacted species as a contrast, we can see the blue showing through. So there has been a geographic contraction, but it's not very large. It's only a bit, bit over 10%. So if we look in geographic space, the decline of this species is relatively small. If we look at niche space for a moment, this is just an example of the pairwise plots of the um, niche hyper volumes that we built for each species. It's dominated for our chytrid non-impacted species by yellow and this bit in the middle um, is the centroid value for each niche dimension. And there's a blue one directly below that. So there's no evidence of any directionality in the centroid shifts. So there's no sh niche shifts for this particular species, but there's also no directional shifts in its environmental characteristics. And those result results contrast quite strongly with our chytrid decline species. So in this case, we can see quite a lot of blue coming through. So we've got each of our um, four niche dimensions, the variables are all scaled. So if we look maybe down the bottom, elevation is the simplest to follow. We can see that there's a lot of blue at higher elevation. So the species is not occupying the higher elevation parts of its distribution anymore. And we can see this reflected in the shift in the niche centroid. So the species is tending to persist in the low elevation environments. And you can see that through, a, um, through them all, but this range of um, different climatic conditions. If we look at the results overall for our 55 species, we can see, so each dot is a species. We have contemporary proportion of extent of occurrence on the Y, and then contemporary proportion of the niche hypervolume occupied on, on the Y, sorry. So all these species sitting on one here for extent of occurrence, they're species that have absolutely no reduction in their extent of occurrence. So their geographic distribution hasn't changed. And then we can see the species scattered throughout this space. And so you'll notice that most species sit below the line. So they're experiencing greater reductions in their niche hyper volume than their geographic extent. And the species that we talked about in the previous slide, we can see maybe only a 10, 15% reduction in distribution, but about a 60% reduction in the range of environmental conditions across which it's occurring. So that was a general pattern that species are losing environmental niche breadth quicker than geographic distribution. And if we look at the results from the Barkey analysis, so here we can see that we have our control group and then we have our chytrid impacted group. So weak evidence for a reduction in geographic distribution across species more broadly. These are our control group. And some of these species are read, um, recognized as declining due to other processes. So it's not surprising that there is some decline here, but we see a much greater decline for our chytrid impacted species. And if we want to know the overall decline for the chytrid impacted species, we can compare it to this dashed gray line. But really, we're most interested in the decline observed 
above and beyond that that was observed for the kindred non-impacted species. And it's the same pattern if you look in niche space, but the relationships are larger. So we see a substantially greater reduction in the type of volume or the niche breadth occupied by our kindred defined species. If we look across the four niche dimensions, the pattern again was repeated. So first, if you look at annual temperature, we can see that you know the kindred control group, the non-impacted, they're slightly going to areas with cooler temperatures. But our kindred impacted species, they're showing a clear shift towards warmer conditions. They're also showing, uh, sorry, that was rainfall, got them mixed up. But this next one is temperature and first one's rainfall. So weather conditions and also warmer conditions, no change at all for rainfall in our control group. And then if we look at mean diurnal range, so the variation within a day from the high temperature to the low temperature, we can see that our kindred impacted species are going to areas with less temperature range, and that they're also going to lower elevation areas. And in general, you could characterize this as a contraction towards coastal areas along species that are on the east coast and the ranges. This, this probably is a pretty horrible figure, but I think it, it might be useful for thinking about why we may see these directional, environmentally selective patterns of decline. So we could just imagine, we could imagine temperature and rainfall here. This is gray shaded area is the realized niche or fundamental niche of chytrid fungus itself. And then we have a frog host species here represented by this green area, but it's declined. So it's now occupying these areas with the red dashed situation. So we could see that probably the declines of species from areas that are highly favorable to chytrid, that's driven by environmental suitability for the fungus itself. So where the fungus is doing really well, it's had a severe impact on the frog. So this is the cooler high elevation areas, and these are sites where the species has become extirpated. But we also see in the middle here that there could be persistence in an area that's quite suitable for the fungus too. And the hypothesis that we had for this work was that the frog should just shift away. Well, not that the frogs themselves aren't shifting, but their niche characteristics should shift away from conditions that are highly suitable for the pathogen. But we didn't find that consistently. We found that they are going to wetter areas, which should be better for the fungus, and areas with less diurnal range. And what we suggest could be happening there is that these could be areas that are favorable for high population growth rate. So like we said with the alpine tree frog, if there's a situation where there can be reliable recruitment, um, that could be driving persistence despite the impact of the pathogen. And we see that in a few specific demographic studies that have been done on both Australian as well as other frog species. So frogs could be persisting in this environment that's suitable for chytrid if they've got high rates of recruitment. And specifically at lower elevation, frogs are um, ectotherms, so their growth is really regulated by external environmental temperatures. So warmer temperatures, higher growth rate, perhaps higher capacity to outbreed the pathogen. All right, this is where Richard comes in to talk about the second case study. That timing's fine, so you can go on. Thanks, Ben. All right. As, uh, as Ben mentioned, um, the Kitchen Frog case study relied on using a lot of occurrence data to be able to document uh, changes in distribution and, and niche characteristics of, of those uh, species over time. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to be able to kind of extend the work that we did with frogs potentially into other taxa and use this kind of approach to explore more generally how niche and range of characteristics are changing in declining species. And so we have a lot of data available on species occurrences that are built up over time. So here I've just downloaded all of the mammal occurrence data that occurs in the Atlas of Living in Australia. I can't remember how many million records there are on here, but there's a lot of them. And then I've just gridded them up and this shows the numbers of records in different grid cells across Australia, and that's on a log 10 scale. So at the top limit, there's are sort of 10,000 records in an individual um, grid cell that, 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 that the uh, bright green represents. And one of the things you can see is that these records show quite a lot of variation in the number, in, in basically in the numbers of records that are being called in different grid cells. And for example, there's this whole section over here that's white where we don't have any records of members at all in those grid cells. And if we were to use this information to kind of get an idea of what, you know, where mammal species were across the landscape, we'd kind of conclude that there's hardly any mammal species in this part of the world and an awful lot uh, in this part of the world. 
And the most likely it doesn't complete when the animals are on the Australian landscape, what was in the city of the sample viruses. There are lots of people who live in this area here, and they record lots of animal species. And relatively few speak people have explored this part of the world and documented what the animals are that are present here. So we have these really strong sampling biases in these kinds of data that we really need to understand and account for, I think, before we can progress what we would like to do, which is to understand change in occupancy and range dynamics. We've got to deal with these sampling biases. All right, here's an example from last week. Uh, Emily's uh, Sandy Edlin mouse. Here's here all of the mammal records I just showed you before, and here are the records for, for, for the Sandy Edlin mouse. And you can see its range is quite patchy, but it's quite likely that patchiness reflects sampling um, you know, biases rather than the fact that you know, it could well occur right throughout this range, but in areas we just haven't sampled yet, uh, the species appears to be absent. And if you look, for example, through time at an individual cell, they often look like this, you know, and, and this is broken up by decade. So we had a record of that species in, in this decade, this decade, this decade, but there were no records of that species in between and so on and so on. Now, for a cell like this, chances are that species has been resident in that grid cell, good grid cells, about 50 by 50 kilometers. Chances are it's been resident in that grid cell throughout that whole time. And these absences represent imperfect detection. It's there, but we didn't detect it, either because people weren't looking for it or they're out looking for other mammal species and they didn't find this particular species. And so what we can do is we can actually use this information to get some idea about, um, if you like, our, our ability to detect the species based on, and here I'm just going to use the numbers of records that were present in each of these decades. And so compare total number of mammal sample effort in this grid cell through the decades as a function of whether we were able to detect the sand leaf inland mouse or not. And when we plot that data, it looks something like this across the whole range of grid cells in which we actually detect that species. And don't worry about this red point at the end here, because it's only based on a couple of, um, of samples. But the general pattern you can see is that if people have gone to a grid cell and they put quite a lot of effort in looking for mammals, as evidenced by the total number of mammal records that we find in that cell, then our chance of finding uh, sanity in inland mass in that cell increases up to a zero point here like this, right? So in other words, if you try hard, where, where we know sanity in the mouse live, if you try hard to detect them, you, you tend to find them about 60% of the time. And if we haven't put much effort into detecting mammals in a given cell, then our detection probability drops off, probably just reflecting the fact we haven't put much effort in them. Right? There's still only about a 60% chance of detecting a sand in the mouse, probably because it's quite a cryptic, small nocturnal species. If we look at a swamp wallaby and do exactly the same thing again, a bigger, probably easier to detect species, you can see if you try hard enough, in cells where we know swamp wallabies occur, you'll detect the swamp wallaby. And then if we have relatively fewer records, our probability of detection declines. And so this provides us really useful information to start to be able to infer what's going on in those cells where we don't have terribly much detection. But we can start to say, if you go, if you go to a cell and you search really hard by looking for lots of mammals, and you don't find a swamp wallaby, chances are it's not there, right? They're, they're easy to detect, and if you try out, you can detect them, right? And in cells where we don't have very few records, and you don't detect the wallaby, then it's quite possible they could be there, obviously, depending on other kind of characteristics associated with where you might expect to find swamp wallabies in the first place. So we can, in a sense, use that sampling bias information that's embedded in this data to derive these detection functions that tell us something about how lucky we are to find particular animal species based on the, on the effort that's gone into overall detection. And in recent years, there's been a whole lot of effort uh, put towards using this kind of imperfect detection information that we might go to, coupled with some modeling functions to overcome these kinds of sampling devices and actually come up with ways to model the temporal dynamics of range shifts in species over time using these types of records. And so here's a recent paper here from 2019 that really is a, a methodology paper that lays out how we can combine this imperfect detection information with, uh, with models of how species ranges might be changing over time to model what's going on. And what, um, what we think is that this is a really useful way forward for us to be able to now make real use out of these occurrence records to address the kinds of questions that being have So 
what I want to do now is just provide a case study of how we can use these type of modeling approaches to get the kind of insights that have been talked about before to the kitchen for other species um, where we have uh, reasonable and current data. And the example that I'm going to use is the northern quoll. Um, the northern quoll has suffered um, significant range collapse um, in the last 100 years or so. So the, the, the kind of reddish pink shading through here shows the distribution of the northern quoll. And the areas that are kind of the lighter shaded areas are the areas from which it's now been locally extirpated in, within the last 100 years or so. So you can see this pattern of quite substantial range collapse through Queensland and the persistence in these coastal areas and now starting to get up into the Northern Territory and the Western Australia where the populations are starting to decline. Now we know quite a lot about probably what drives this collapse and all that the answer now it's canecos invasion. Uh, and so that for this species is a major threatening process. And so what I want to now do now is to show how we can use the kind of modeling approaches that I just talked about to get a bit more insight into what's going on with this range collapse and the, the pattern of decline. So what I've done here is then just use that kind of detection function approach and the kind of modeling approaches that are outlined in that paper to model the pattern of changes in ranges in northern quolls. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, um, but basically, you know, up here, the black dots are all of the uh, current records for northern quolls that we have available that outline probably what its range was prior to Pango arrival back in the 1920s, 1930s. Here, the black dots represent the records for cane codes that have been collected from the decade starting in 2010. And you can obviously see that where it was previously present in parts of Queensland, we had no longer have occurrence records. And there are kind of black dots for each of these um, graphs I've shown you here. It's going to start more in. But what I've shown you here is the model of how the range has changed over time in terms of the probability that's, that these good cells are occupied by quolls. And the bright green, the higher the probability of occupancy, and so you can see it's contemporary distribution, and then you can see its range starting to contract away from those areas that we see, particularly through here, to end up in its sort of contemporary range now. So the point of that is just to show what the pattern of change has been. In fact, we can model it, we can model it quite nicely, and it fits really nicely with the black dots. We, we do we seem to do a reasonable job on but, but, but this model seems to be, do a reasonable job on modeling this decline. And now that we can model what's happening through time, we can start to ask, okay, let's look in a bit more detail about what's going on here. So what I'm going to show you here, so the uh so the, so the the dark outline bits are the, are the kind of original range of poles. And, and what I'm showing you here is a change in occupancy for each grid cell um, from one decade to the next. So here's from 1920 to 1930. And the gray areas just indicate no change, no occupancy. And when you start to see the red shading come in, that indicates a decline in occupancy for those cells. You can start to see what the pattern of range contraction has been. You can see that it starts to kind of redden up around the edge of the range here. That reddening kind of moves in, and we'll focus on Queensland here, moves in towards the coast a bit, further in towards the coast, then deep. And so the general pattern that you see, particularly if we just focus on Queensland here, this pattern of range collapse starting on the edge of the range away from the coast and moving in towards those coastal areas. So the range is collapsing, if you like, from the outside in that towards the coast. All right. I mentioned before the major threat of the species of cane toads. And so we can do exactly the same thing here. And here we're modeling changes in the distribution of cane toads over time, again, using those occurrence records. And so here are the black dots. Well, here are the black drops that show the distribution of cane toads in the 1930s that were introduced to the coastal part of northern Queensland there in about 1934 by a control agent, and they've subsequently spread from there to their current sort of extent of occupancy given by all the black dots there in 2010. And again, we've used our model and these occurrence records and how those occurrence records have changed over time, the model range expansion in the species from the 30s up to 2010. Uh, and so you can see what's happened with the cane toads is that they were introduced along the coast here and they've essentially expanded out from those coastal populations out towards, and again, I've marked the coral range on here as those, as those dots here, expanded out here and then shifted up 
you know, out, out from Queensland. They stop uh, like too dry, so they get stopped by the desert and arid areas out here, and then they're expanding up into the Northern Territory and across. Into, into Australia. Yeah. Okay. What I've done here then is I've just uh, so what you can see in this graph here, obviously, is that there are now some parts of the contemporary, the current coal distribution, which in which cane toads now occupy their range. And there are parts of coal distribution that cane toads haven't got. And so what I'm going to do here then is just compare the change in coal probability of occupancy at sites where, oh, show, it's where cane toads are absent, which is up the top here, which the title's obscured, sorry, and those where cane toads are now present. So you can see in those parts of the coral range where cane toads haven't got to yet, um, there's been a slight decline in, in their overall extent of occupancy, so I think it's gone down a little bit, but not terribly much at all. And you see in those areas where cane toads are present, we see in many cells this massive collapse of occupancy that are basically getting major decline of extirpation out of those cells that they once created the occupant. We know cane toads in fact more than well, so this is, I guess, terribly surprising. But it's kind of nice to see in a, in a model like this if we were potentially sort of capturing what's going on here. Cane toads look to be having a major impact on driving these whole population projects. There. So they're a major threatening process in the system. And then we can start to have a look at what's going on between the sort of range dynamics of the cane toads and the coal. So remember, I said before that the cane toads populate, the, sorry, the coal populations collapse from the edge of this boundary here in towards the coast. And that's the opposite of what the cane toads are doing, right? The cane toads expanded out from these coastal areas. And you can kind of see, say, maybe starting in the 1960s, just as cane toads start to hit this boundary around here, you start to see the coral population start to collapse out on the edge, and that collapse in the inwards. And so what we've got the situation is we've got a bunch of coral populations out on the coast here that have been exposed to cane toads for quite a period of time and we haven't shown range collapse. And we've got these populations out on the range edge that pretty much as soon as cane toads get there, their populations start to collapse and they start to collapse inwards towards the coast. All right, so there's an interesting dynamic going on here and it's really some kind of, if you like, kind of time delay between what's happening with coral collapse and how long they've been exposed to the stripping process. So what I want to do, Quickly now is just show, show you a, different, a way to sort of visualize what's going on. And I'm going to visualize it in terms of what I call cumulative cane toad optics, right? Each of these lines represents a grid cell and the change in coal probability of occupancy over time. So okay, a line that goes like this represents uh, uh, a grid cell that was occupied by coals before cane toads arrived. And then as cane toads have arrived, and as we add up the amount of time that cane toads have been present in the cell, we can track the essentially the collapse of the whole population within that grid cell. Okay, so this is like a cumulative measure. So a two here would, in this case, represent a grid cell that was occupied for two decades at, at a really high probability of occupancy by cane toads that were there. And there for two decades, and the more decades it's occupied. The, the greater this kind of threatening, the level of this threatening process that have been exposed to. And these are sites greater than 200 kilometers from the coast. And you can see that cane toads don't have to be there for terribly long and the populations are starting to, to collapse. And then this is just looking at distance from the coast. So these are uh, obscured, but this I think is 150 to 200, sorry, 100 to 200 k from the coast. But basically we get closer to the coast if you go like that. And what you see happening is that these guys collapse real fast with relatively low limits of exposure to cane toads. And once we get close to the coast, we see that we have these populations that have been able to hang on despite quite high exposure to cane toads for a long period of time. They haven't shown any declines, and perhaps now we're starting to see their occupancy probably safe. So these, if you like, then at this end here represent. Those areas being talked about where the threat of cane toads is amplified under that set of conditions. And the guys down in this end here that seem to be able to hang on are uh, areas where cane toad threat seems to be reduced because they're able to sit for quite long despite high levels of exposure to that threat. All right, what's going on? Obviously, distance to the coast doesn't tell us terribly much. Presumably, like 
is being put back to kick it. There's some environmental factors that are mitigating the impacts of pain birds on, on these crow populations. And I'm just going to focus, I mean, we don't know what that is. And I'm going to uh, just talk about two things that are likely candidates for potential mitigators of what's going on. One is aridity, this one here. So you can see that towards the coast, we've got much wetter environments, and as you move inland, it gets much drier. And the second one is topographic heterogeneity, particularly in this part of Queensland here. Coastal systems through here tend to be much more essentially topographically like higher out towards the coast. They're a lot more up down and, and rugged um, sort of mountainous terrain. And then as you move inland, that, that topography becomes more subdued. It eventually kind of flattens out as you get the fire. So I'm just going to focus on these two. Got niche accents that, that might be important in, in what's going on here. Um, and I'll talk about why they I mean, guess why they're important, probably. And I'll, I'll come back to it at, at the end once you speculate on what's going on. So, here I've just drawn that same picture again before we use distance to the coast to divide up the different grid cells and look at how their coil occupancy dynamics are changing over time. Here I've just created an index of aridity plus topography. You would love me for that, but I just kind of added them together. And so, you know, basically down this end here, we've got all the sites that are inland, arid, and flat. And as we head out towards the coast, we get sites that are much more wet and rugged. Well, that's, you know, it's not necessarily directly related to the coast. That's a general pattern. We get wet and rugged spots elsewhere. But what you can see is the same pattern as we saw before. These arid flat environments, we see rapid collapse in response to you know lower levels of that threatening process. And what we see in the wet and rugged locations where the populations can hang on um, despite high levels of exposure to that threat. So you can see what we saw before here just expressed in terms of uh, kind of niche actions that might make some, some sense as to what's going on. Why would that be important? Well, like Ben mentioned before, you know, there's a there's a range of processes that could be mitigating the impacts here. So we know, for example, wet areas are potentially more productive, and so we could see demographic resilience. Basically, the corals are now free, the, the mortality of the suffered through cane toads in these in these wetter regions, and potentially something to do with topographic heterogeneity that might, for example, make it difficult for cane toads to get around the landscape, but by some sort of refuge where corals may be able to persist in the place of the cane toads at the time. We don't we don't know what, what those mechanisms might be, but again this points to things that we could start and look at that might be important in driving what's going on. And then I'm just gonna present this in another way that, that's kind of similar to the way that Ben was presenting in terms of kind of niche space. So we can again kind of visualize what's going on and get a sense of what's happening. So now each of these panels represent what was going on in each of the different decades over time. Each of these dots represents one of our grid cells, and the color of the dot represents by how much it has declined since the 1930s, right? So yellow means no decline, purple down here means you know, deep, deep purple means there is still an extirpate of that grid cell that collapsed. And here I've got a cumulative. The cumulative exposure to pain toes, so the exposure to the threat against this topographic heterogeneity index that we've got that represents how rugged the landscape is those grid cells on the island. And so you can see to start off with all of the grid cells, they haven't had much exposure to cane toads because cane toads have only been introduced in the 1930s. And most of the exposure occurs up here in these topographically heterogeneous grid cells, and see the ones out towards the coast. And we see don't see any declines yet. And then we see as time goes by, these coast, these topographically rugged sites are getting higher exposure to cane toads, just because time goes by and cane toads are in their environment. And you see there's so more exposure to cane toads, but we don't, we're not really seeing any declines yet in the coral populations. And then it's not till we get to about the 1960s and 70s that all of a sudden we start to see certain grid cells starting to collapse, the coral populations start to decline. The key thing, like in the plants, is it's not random. We're seeing collapse really only starting to occur in these grid cells that are that are, that are low topographic heterogeneity. They're more subdued, flatter inland, more arid landscapes where collapse, and it doesn't require very much exposure to toads for that collapse to start happening. Right. And then we just essentially over time see that kind of pattern repeated. 
so that by the end point now, where we are from now, we've got complete collapse in these, in these sites down here. And we've got check this button here. Yeah. Again, we've got essentially these kind of refuges out here at these sites of Pytepic where, where we had threat reduction, and we've got these sites that seem really susceptible to seems like the threat of being gets And you know, you know, too, like, all right, these guys have hung on quite well. But, you know, we're starting to see the same problems, even in those kind of main system parts of the landscape of the list. And again, just to illustrate again, we can do the same sort of thing. And here I've plotted two niche axes, so this is equivalent to those. Two kinds of, you know, the kind of niche plots that Ben was showing, bivariate niche plots. So look at how um, contraction has occurred in niche space. And then the nice thing about the modern sort of approach that we've got here is that we have you know, just got two time periods. What's going on? We can actually map what's happening over time and watch how that um, how contraction is occurring in different parts of the niche space. Again, which potentially provides us some insight into what the processes are that is driving this kind of decline, or at least allows it to generate some hypotheses about it, about models. And again, here we see that the collapse is occurring in the more arid sites, so there's low values of this heritage index, the topographically subdued sites, and our refugia sites where we it's mitigating those streets out in the water more coastal locations. All right, so just to summarize, I guess, um, what we're hoping is we're developing some useful tools that allow us to look at what's going on over time and range collapse and to think about these, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. both ex geographic changes as well as niche changes. And in the case of the coals, um, you know, like I've already said, we see that quite strong pattern in terms of sustainability to that kind of thing. All right, I'm just going to hand over to Ben now to start. So we just have up. two slides to wrap up where we hopefully talk a bit about some of the broader scale implications of what we can, um, what we can, I guess, better understand in terms of patterns of species declines from this type of work. So the first is that in some cases where we have these really environmentally selective patterns of declines, we actually need to rethink what, our, what we see as the habitat characteristics or requirements of these species. And I've got a photo here of the armored mist frog, a frog species that was thought to be extinct when the hitchard emerged. It wasn't seen for a few decades. Prior to its decline, it was known from sites that looked something like this. So close canopy, upland, rainforest sites. So very specific, cool environmental conditions. And as far as we know, it's been a lot of resurvey effort. It's completely extirpated from that environment now. And where it persists is at this site. So it just persists at one site. And you can see that this, this site, even if you just look at them, they're really different. So it doesn't persist anywhere where there's the high threat amplification. Kitrid is here, but this environment has a lot more sunlight hitting the stream itself. So there's basically no canopy cover on the stream, but it's also in an area that has a warmer climate overall as well. So if we think about the armored mist frog as an upland rainforest specialist frog, now in the presence of kitchen and kitchen's not going away, that's no longer true. So our conceptualization of what habitat species have can change when we have these pretty strong environmentally selective patterns of decline. The next thing is that when we have this contraction to a certain narrower subset of environmental conditions, we suggest that it probably likely increases vulnerability to other threatening processes. So generally species with small distributions and small ecological niche breadth, they're the species that are most vulnerable to extinction. And so in the case of our frogs, the areas that are predicted to be refugia for climate change are the areas that have been taken out by hydric fungus. So we have this situation where narrower set of environmental conditions can predispose species to other threatening processes. And then we probably have a situation where we could be having loss of fundamental niche breadth in these species. So the realized niche collapses, and if there's local genetic adaptation to certain environmental conditions, and that adaptation is underpinning the upper or lower bounds of species physiological tolerances, then we could actually have reductions in the niche breadth they are occupying. That's an important thing if we start thinking about translocations or reintroduction efforts. And then finally, just thinking about this in the conservation context. So as Richard said, if we can identify these macro scale patterns of declines to certain environmental spaces, um, or areas where they've been cystic or been extirpated, this can start to help us target management or at least to guide 
other studies where we may identify the mechanisms in more detail. I also think that it's, it's probably a good time to start thinking about potentially considering niche dynamics and changes in niche characteristics in assessments of species threat. And so some other authors have also suggested this, and I think we're at a stage where we have the capacity, as, as Richard presented, to have some pretty nice modeling of these patterns. We have a lot of data for a lot of species, so there's an opportunity there. And then lastly, I think that if we can start applying this approach to different taxonomic groups with different threats, there's the potential that we might identify areas where species that are facing different threats, as well as that have vastly different characteristics may be persisting. And then that opens up the opportunity for really proactive spatial conservation planning to identify the areas that most be might be most robust for different threatening processes. So we'll leave it there. Um, with the frog work that we just published recently, there's a whole range of co-authors that did that. And as Richard said, with the issues with the occurrence data, we were we aimed to overcome that both with the Barkey design and the analyses, but also with a lot of really detailed work. And as I said, 40 odd species of frogs to find from Kitra, but we were only able to get sufficient data for 25 species. Um, so we are, we'll leave it there. Any questions? Yeah, thanks. It's, it's interesting, thought breaking stuff. I was a little confused by the frog example. You defined the axes of the frogs, the, the niche axes of frogs, seemingly by what you knew were the chytrids' favored habitats. Isn't that a little bit like saying, you know, the range of the frog will reduce where the effect of the chytrid is strongest? I mean, it. It's sort of self-fulfilling. Yeah, in a way, I guess you could say that. Um, annual temp. So if you look at modeling species distribution and niches more broadly, the factors that influence the potentially kitrid as well as the frogs could be the same. And I think in this case, so if you model the distribution of Australian frogs, things like elevation, annual temperature, annual rain are going to be quite important predictors. And we know that from some other work that's been done. But yeah, why we actually did those specific variables was because we that was what we asked to do by reviewers. Um, but I think that because we had that specific hypothesis that this threatening process is driving the contraction, that yeah, we should see where it's highly suitable for kitchen become unsuitable for frogs. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in terms of generality, that's quite an unusual situation. Essentially, you've got a known stressor that you know affects a group, and so they share the same niche axes. And so but that that's not common for other stresses. There's lots and lots of other stresses that either wouldn't have niche components you could describe in that way. Um, so they're a contaminant or whatever else. Uh, so it, it seems to me that th this situation is essentially just a species interaction story where two species are interacting closely because they occupy a similar niche. I don't quite understand how that in a general sense is a niche occupancy question it's just a straight out overlap strong interactions because you live in the same places thing yeah it's not just overlap because we've done previous work the overlap with kitra distribution and frog declines doesn't correlate well um and as i mentioned with that background slide we have a situation where it's only under so kitra is much more widely distributed but it only causes declines in a certain area and so you know, back to the broader point but that's that's an open question of how why spread environmentally selective patterns of decline are. So yeah, where there's species, two species, and you know, invasive species are one of the leading causes of decline. So it's not just a um, isolated case. But say habitat loss, human land use conversion is really environmentally selective. So you know, humans will aim to farm and have more intensive agriculture in certain environmental conditions. Um, climate change then species we would also anticipate that perhaps they're most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in a certain environmental space um and i think the impacts of climate change are evenly spelt felt across species niches so it's something we want to test for sure that's the idea with some of the methods which is developing i suspect that probably environmentally selected patterns of decline will be pretty widespread but it's to be tested but it's a good question Thank you.
So with the niche, you're talking about reduction in niche. Um, is there any way to know if there's been change in niche to a new niche that hasn't been seen before in that species? Yeah, so like I said, we, we couldn't do that with frogs because of the way we um, subset the data. But niche contraction, they're also something that I think would be really interesting. We do know there's a range of native species there, for example, like rainbow lorikeets. You know, since we can for a very period of time, we can see that they have these niche expansions. And I think with the method you're talking about, Richard, that's probably much more, I guess, more appropriate to try to examine also niche expansions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's one of the reasons we were interested in that. That was a limitation of the birth method. Thanks. Yeah, that, no, that was uh, really interesting stuff. What could could you just outline very briefly? Because I'm conscious that we're getting to lunchtime. What how you would see this impacting the the red lists? I mean, I'd love to see the red lists impacted. I call them the dead lists. But uh, how do you think it'll it'll actually change what's done? Well, yeah, that's a good point. And it's you know we. We hunt and hunt about putting that in the you know the second last paragraph of the discussion of that paper because we didn't want it to be throwaway. It's a bigger conversation, of course. Um, I think there would be scope if you look at the criteria. You're probably familiar with them, the definitions of um, change over certain lengths of time associated with the different categories. I think probably we might not want to look at just niche breadth per se because that's quite a coarse measure and a reduction in that. But that's one candidate. But also to understand um, more broadly the range and across particular dimensions, how they were happening, to what extent they were happening. But the key challenge is is making the same comparison between species. So that's a it's a nice thing in, in a way about extent of occurrence. It's just how many square meters or kilometers do you occupy. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of shortcomings with that approach too. So it's it's down in track. Uh, for Richard, I love the model. Uh, I was just thinking about the uh, decline ranges of the quolls on the east. Yeah, and um, it looks really nicely correlated, at least with the um, topography and aridity. What? How would you move that then to predicting the decline in the west where the toads aren't yet? Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, Okay, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's kind of a bit of a technical question, but your choice of EOO, which is, if I'm not mistaken, just a minimum convex polygon yeah. around that, okay. isn't that a bit of a funny choice because it's really susceptible to outlaw, uh, outliers? Because, you know, just one point at the margins kind of had a big reduction. Wouldn't be some more what, kernel methods kind of um, be less susceptible to this kind of? And effects and maybe more robust in terms of analysis analysis yes. so the, the method well, why we chose that method is because it's the method that's recommended by the IUCN. so we wanted that kind of be comparable and fit in with the criteria of how it's assessed by the IUCN. so that's why we did that the minimum convex hulls they do also account within the package in which that's implemented and recommended by the IUC density of points to some extent so it's not just a polygon around the points, but yeah, they are susceptible to outliers. That's a good, but that's why, I guess that was part of the point to illustrate it. And you see that with the um, Miss Frog example, it's extent of occurrence doesn't really change, but within that extent of occurrence, it's shifting to a subset of environmental space. And that's because if you look at the topography of the wet tropics, you have these river valleys going inland. So you can still have low elevation populations that are relatively distant from the coast. And so right next to them is mountain, it's a gorge country. And the species is excavated from up the top of the mountains, but not down low in the valley. So the overall extent of occurrence isn't changing, but it's moving to a particular subset of that state. Okay.
Okay. Yeah. It's gone past 12.30, so I think I probably should let Ben and Richard off the hook and thank them for their presentation. Are you... Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.